Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to our session on international student experiences at HDS. I'm going to give it about you know, 30 seconds to a minute for any other attendees to sign in uh, and get that you know, cup of coffee, sip of tea, and we'll get started in just a moment. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, my name is Alessandra Ludeking, and I'm the admissions officer here at Harvard Divinity School. You'll see my intro slide in just a second, but I want to take this moment just to thank you again for tuning in. It's early afternoon here in Cambridge, although I'm signing in from sunny Miami, Florida. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with my very esteemed colleague, Katie Caponera, and a wonderful panel of students coming from international experiences who would be willing to share with you about their time as students, both in the United States and at Harvard Divinity School specifically. And so we hope that the session will be helpful to you as you consider studying here in the United States. So what you can expect for this session, I'm gonna start with a brief 10 minute overview of Harvard Divinity School, talking to you a little bit about uh, student life, the academic experience, the application process. And then I'll go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, Katie, and our wonderful panel of students so that they can, um, uh, so that they can undertake that discussion so you can learn a little bit about their experiences. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn my camera off for these first 10 minutes, and then you'll see me again at, at the end of, of this overview. So again, in case you, you didn't see me a little bit earlier, here's my picture. I've been with Harvard Divinity School as an admissions officer for about six months, and I was previously at Harvard Law School as an admissions officer there for a few years. So I'm definitely not new to the, to the Harvard community. I'm originally from Miami, Florida, and I came up here to the Northeast uh, to Boston College to study English and international studies. Faith has always been an important part of my life, and it's a great privilege for me to be here at Harvard Divinity School among students, faculty, and staff members who come from such an array of, of, of backgrounds. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about Harvard Divinity School. So Harvard Divinity School was founded in 1816 as the first divinity school in the United States. It is a non-sectarian or non-religiously affiliated school of religious and theological studies that educate students in both the academic study of religion as well as the practice of religion and preparation for leadership in religious, governmental, and a wide range of service organizations. We have more than 45 faith traditions represented in our student body, including, of course, students who are not religiously affiliated, and we have over 500 recurring worship services. Altogether, this makes Harvard Divinity School the most religiously pluralistic divinity school in the world. Our applicants often wonder what career paths are available to students with a religious degree. And our degree programs honestly lead to infinite pathways with alumni in every field and industry who value ethical leadership. They're looking for religious literacy. They're service oriented and mission driven. I always find it interesting that our graduates describe developing skills such as deep listening or ethical reasoning, bridging divides successfully, 
and navigating difficult conversations as part of their experience. And these are skills that are transferable to any professional field or setting. So that's a little bit just a snapshot of Harvard Divinity School at large, but I also wanna show you what our first year students look like. So this is a snapshot of the students that we admitted in last year's cycle. So as you can see here, the most popular degree program is the Master of Theological Studies with 96 students currently in that program. The next comes the Master of Divinity with 52 students in that program. We have 12 students in the Master of Religion and Public Life, four students in our special student program, and only two in our Master of Theology. And I'll touch base a little bit more on what these degree programs are in just a second. As you'll see, our first year class is also comprised of 55% who identify as female, 34% as male, and 7% identify as non-binary. The average age for our first year students is 28 years old, with an age range that spans from 21 to 68 years. And as I mentioned earlier, we have over 45 religious affiliations represented, 46 to be exact, and 62 languages spoken. My favorite statistic though is the one in the middle. Our first year class is a total of 165 students. And of those 165, we have 121 undergraduate institutions represented. So our students are really coming to us from a vast array of institutions and academic training. So that's just a quick overview of our first year students. And then of course, I wanna to touch base with you on the four degree programs that we do offer. As I mentioned, the most popular one is the Master of Theological Studies or the MTS. This is a two year full-time degree. And it's essentially applicants for this program are looking for a broad study in religion and they have opportunities to concentrate in one of 18 areas of focus. Students in this program are essentially looking to prepare for a doctoral program in religion or perhaps some related discipline, or maybe they're looking to approach a different professional field such as law, journalism, education, the arts, medicine, public policy, all from a perspective that's enriched by theological study. As you can see, we offer generous institutional grant aid for the MTS. Now, the Master of Divinity is a three-year full-time degree, and, and we like to call this degree is for 21st century spiritual leaders. So essentially, applicants to this program are students who are really interested in learning the art of ministry, and we define ministry with a lowercase m. It's very broadly conceived and includes anything from preaching to pastoral care, community organizing, some social justice mission-driven work. Uh, that the applicant is interested in pursuing down the line. Uh, what's unique about the Master of Divinity is that it's really linking the theory from the classroom to the practice with uh, fieldwork experience, similar to internship placements um, across you know, the country and, and even around the globe. So that's the Master of Divinity. Just like the MTS, we have generous institutional grant aid available for that program. Then we have the Master of Theology or the THM. As you saw in the previous slide, there are only two students enrolled in this program because it is a little bit more niched. So it's only a one year full-time degree and it's intended for candidates who already have a Master of Divinity or its equivalent. And they're just seeking to pursue a new direction, a, a, a deeper focus on a ministry that's already existing, or they're just looking to advance their particular understanding of uh, an area in religion. There is no institutional grant aid available for this uh, master's degree, but we do have federal funding options available. And then finally, we have our Master of Religion and Public Life. This is the newest master's degree that we're offering. This is also a one-year full-time degree, and it's a really cool program. It's actually designed for candidates who are already uh, mid-career professionals. This can be second, third, fourth career professionals who are just looking to take a pause on those careers to come to Harvard Divinity School for one year and learn about the ways in which religion impacts the, their careers, the work that they do, and then to bring that knowledge back with them to inform their, their pr professional pursuits. Just like the THM, there is no institutional grant aid available for this program, but we do have federal funding options. So those are the degree programs. And then of course, 
uh, we wouldn't have these without the outstanding faculty that teach and lead these degree programs. So um, it's no exaggeration for me to say that our faculty are among the most distinguished scholars of religion in the world. We have over 80 faculty and guest lecturers that teach uh, close to 200 or a little over 200 courses every year. Uh, and our faculty teach in uh, the five major religious traditions, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, and of course, many others. As you can see, over half of our faculty are tenured women or faculty of color, and a little over one third specialize in non-Christian traditions. What's uh, another important takeaway from Harvard Divinity School in particular is that we have a very fla flexible cross-registration uh, policy. So our students can take classes even outside of Harvard Divinity School to uh, other Harvard graduate schools and through the Boston Theological Interreligious Consortium, which is a consortium of 10 theological institutions of higher education in the Boston area. So uh, if you're... Um, an MDiv or an MTS applicant, this flexibility is particular to you. All right, so that's our faculty. And then of course, Harvard Divinity School wouldn't be what it is without our wonderful students. And you'll hear directly from some of them in just a few moments, but we have over 35 student organizations that are supported by the Office of Student Life and Katie Caponera, whom you'll see in just a few moments can definitely talk to you a little bit more about, about that. It's also really easy to start your own uh, student organization if you can't find one that quite meets your, your interests. Uh, some of the ones that I like to call out are our Queer Rights Student Org, Harry Potter and the Sacred Text, our Garden Group, and Third Chapter, which is a group for students over 50 years old. And these student organizations all host over 60 student-led events each year, in addition to the 500 recurring worship services that I mentioned, uh, and so we have a really, really vibrant community life, and I encourage you to ask questions of our students about this um, during the panel discussion. And then really quickly, we understand, of course, that graduate school is a, an expensive investment into your future. And so I do want to talk to you about the options that we offer. We offer two forms of institutional grant aid, and again, these are limited to MTS and MDiv applicants. So the vast majority of our MDiv and MTS applicants do receive some form of financial aid. Typically, this will be need-based. So 90% to be exact receive um, some sort of financial aid. Um, as I mentioned, the vast majority receive need-based and we do have three tiers of need-based aid. We offer a three-quarter tuition grant, a full tuition grant or a full tuition grant with a modest living stipend for those demonstrating the most need. This need-based aid would require a financial aid application that will become available in January. And then we have a very small pool of merit aid that is available and awarded on the basis of an applicant's uh, file, the strength of their application file. Uh, all applicants to our MTS and MDiv programs are automatically considered for merit aid, so there is no formal application process for this. If uh, an applicant is awarded merit aid, it would be a full tuition grant, so 100% tuition plus a modest stipend. All merit award decisions are released in the offer of admission letter, and all need-based aid awards are released within 24 hours of your offer of admission. So you'll know all of the information you need to know um, very soon after being offered admission. And then really quickly, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the actual application requirements to, uh, to apply to our master's programs. I'll touch only on the interview as this is the newest feature that we are piloting this admission cycle. So we will be inviting select candidates to interview virtually with a member of the admissions committee. And this will be invitations that are sent sometime in late January, early February. More information will be provided to those candidates who are invited. Every admitted student is required to interview, but not every candidate will be invited to interview. And then really quickly with our timeline below, our application has been open since September. And we'll be closing the first week of January. So the deadline is coming up uh, in just about one month. 
We do not operate on a rolling admissions basis, so you're more than welcome to submit your application anytime between now and then. We won't actually begin reviewing any of your applications until after the deadline has passed. Once the deadline has passed, our Office of Financial Aid will reach out to you with instructions on how to apply for that need-based financial aid that I was talking to you about just a moment ago. And then, as I mentioned, all admissions decisions will be released at the same time in mid-March. If you happen to have any questions related to the admissions or application process, please do feel free to reach out. That's a QR code on the corner there to stay connected with our office and receive updates on recruitment events, on uh, admissions timelines, and et cetera. And of course, our email is a great place to reach us directly, or you can contact current students. They'll be happy to talk to you about their experiences at HDS. And then our blog and Instagram are great ways to keep in touch with all of the wonderful events that are happening uh, at HDS. So that's enough from me. Um, I am excited to uh, invite Katie Caponera and our wonderful students, Swati, Mayank, Martim, and Sunshine to uh, turn on their cameras. Uh, they'll be now taking over with the discussion. Thank you, uh, Katie. Thank you, our students. And uh, we hope that, that you enjoy uh, the panel discussion. Greetings, everyone. Um, welcome again to this session on international student experience. As Alessandra said, I'm Katie Caponera. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Assistant Director for Student Services Programming. Um, I work primarily out of the Office of Student Life, and I've been at HDS for eight and a half years now. Um, a little bit about what my office does. We're here to support students in their life outside of the classroom. Um, my colleague, Steph Gaucho, likes to say, we know that your life doesn't stop when you come to graduate school, that there are personal considerations, family considerations, all sorts of things. And we're here to support you in those aspects of your time and your life um, in the HDS community. A little bit about what I do. I, as I said, oversee the Office of Student Life. Um, this means I support orientation programming. So I'm one of the first folks that will help uh, acclimate you to the HDS community. Um, I also support, support commencement programming. So I help you on your way out into the world um, after HPS as well. In between that, I oversee student organizations, student programming, um, publicity and communication efforts to students. I'm the one that sends a lot of emails to students about um, events and updates and announcements and all of that. Um, and really our office is just a place for you to stop by, grab some candy, chat, get a question answered, help you find who you need to be connected to about whatever it is you are looking for more information on. Um, so enough about me. I'm not the one you're here to hear from. It's our wonderful students. We are joined by three current international students um, and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves a little bit more fully in just a second. Um, Alessandra mentioned, you know, student organizations and you can start your own. We have two students who started their own organizations with us today. Maybe they'll tell you a little bit about that, um, as well as hosted various programs and events on campus. So, um, as Alessandra mentioned, we're joined by Martim, Swati, and Sunshine. We have a fourth student who may be joining us a little bit later. I'm not sure um, where he is, but perhaps my uncle pop in and we'll throw it over to him when he does. But if not, we have three wonderful folks to hear from um, as it is. So if each of you could give a brief introduction of yourself, what you're studying, where you came to HDS from, and anything else you'd like to share um, for our prospective students to hear. Um, I'm gonna just kind of go in the order I see you on my screen. So I'm gonna start with Martim, go over to Sunshine and then Swati. Hi everyone, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Um, so my name is Martim, I am from Portugal and I am a first year MTS student. Um, I focus in philosophy of religion. Before I came to HDS, I was studying philosophy and literature. I was really interested in religion. And yeah, uh, I found the program of HDS, uh, of MTS at HDS 
uh, on Harvard's website and was really fascinated from the start. Before I studied a little bit of music and uh, sound engineering, so I come from a very you know diverse background. And yeah, um, th that's me. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Sunshine, or actually that's my nickname. Uh, my um, Chinese name is Wu Shangxia. Um, so I'm originally from China um, and I'm currently a second year MTS. Um, I suppose to be concentration is comparative studies, but there might be some adjustment about that coming up. Um, and I did my undergrad also here in the United States. Um, uh, so when I was doing my bachelor's, I studied religion and math. So it's a little bit crossroad of everything. And here, I guess my focus right now, it's more on like um, the Islamic traditions um, in China. So um, yeah, that's probably it. So if people have questions about like transitioning from an international like college student to an international graduate student, I'm also very happy to speak about that. Hello everyone, I am Swati. I'm a second year MTS student like Sunshine and I focus on comparative studies and South Asian religious traditions. More broadly, I would say I focus on history of religions and Hinduism within these two frameworks. And prior coming to HDS, I was a student of comparative literature and translation studies. So those were the fields that I was focusing on. And I had my undergraduate studies back in India. So if you have any questions about transitioning to HDS as an international student, and primarily the one who has not had their first degrees in the European or Western university context, so I would be happy to help with those questions. Thank you all so much. Um, as you can already see, we have folks um, with various international experiences, some who have studied a great deal in the US prior to coming to HDS, some who it's their first experience studying in the US or in a Western um, college or university. So if your experience um, or your questions don't match up with some of the students represented here on the panel, though I think we have a great representation of students. There are other mechanisms by which you can reach out to current students through admissions and their Ask Students channel, so keep that in mind. Um, but as our students, I have a few questions I'm going to throw at our panelists, and if any questions come up for you during their chatting, feel free to enter them into the Q&A feature in Zoom, and at the end of our session, I'll pose those questions to our panelists as well. So please feel free to type them in as they come up for you. So the first question I have um, for our three panelists is, what has been positive about your experience as an international student at HDS? We can go in the same order if that works for everybody. Yeah, so everything is really fantastic here. Like. It, it was a huge surprise to like come to this very elite institution. You know, I was feeling intimidated, feeling that I may not be, you know, up to score with, you know, what what kind of rigorous academic life goes on here. Um, but the best thing I found is that I don't know how they do it, but HDS has managed to put together all of these really amazing people, be they students or faculty. I have not met one person and especially one professor that has not been not only an excellent teacher, but also a very fine human being. So that's been really great. Um, the resources are fantastic. The library I love, uh, like student groups, the choir, I've, I've had the pleasure to be part of the choir for a few sessions, which is, I mean, Chris Hosfeld, who is the director of music and ritual here, does an amazing job. He does this like this very short 30 minute uh, uh, rehearsal and by we warm up and by the end we're singing beautifully. I don't know how he does it. It's really fantastic. And then another thing I would say is this is the first time I've, I've been in a university where I feel that the school is for us. 
Like I remember speaking like to Chris Hosfeld about using the piano in the chapel, you know, because I didn't know if I could go or not, if I could use it because I'm a piano piano player. And he was like, you know, if you don't, if you're not going to bother people, this is for you. Like th this school, all of this is for you to make the best of it. And I found that just fantastic. Yeah, um, I echo everything that Martin just says. Um, and I think for me, the most positive experience is just finding the community um, here, which is like very, very um, diverse, but at the same time, just very, very close knit and such a warm community. And I got a lot of support, like not just from the different international students, but also from like domestic students. And it's very interesting because when I was like um, doing my bachelor's, I come from a larger school and you can feel that there are like people who are kind of divided by their different like cultural backgrounds and groups and like what major they're in versus I feel like here at HDS, everyone is really willing to listen and really willing to learn. Um, you don't really get as much as what I would call like U.S. supremacy <laughs> um, when like I had experience before. So that's just very nice. And also um, this uh, Office of Student Life, Katie, is very supportive <laughs> of um, the different events and organizations that we're trying to organize to honor different traditions. I think like a couple of weeks ago, Swati can speak more of that. Um, they organized the Wally event and we had like celebration of the Day of Dead and stuff like that. And a lot of it just ideas that pop up and like we managed to do it in a couple of weeks. It's not like it's a tradition that always happened. And I'm just very grateful that we are able to do all of these things. And um, yeah, and all of our different experiences are honored. Oh, well, I would say thank you, Martin and Sunshine, because that was like that echoes a lot of student experiences of mine as well. And, you know, Chris Hospital and singing in the choir. And I think as they were talking, there was only one thing that I felt that I could add on, which is the highlight, which is community tea. And Katie, thanks a lot for that. So uh, community tea is like this long long hds tradition that on tuesday evenings the entire community gathers for a meal and that's the time when you get to meet all your professors colleagues cohort mates and students and friends and there are different student organizations and regular both religious and non-religious um fellowships meetings and well wellness and meditative meetings that take place all over the campus all over the week and on weekends where you can collaborate and meet your peers and supervisors as well and another thing that really really makes me feel very heartwarming here at HDS is the way that both Martin and Sunshine said the closely knit yet very diverse community that we have so Every day you walk into HDS premises, you cannot walk out without chatting to say 10 or 20 people. That's what my life has been like. There are people who would just, you know, come and sit and share a meal with you and you would end up having three more better perspectives on what you are reading because conversations are such that they just start by, hello, what you're doing? What class are you just out of? And they just start of that instantly and I really, really hope that when you guys join and all the best for you, uh, your applications, you also get to feel this warmth and this feeling of family at HDS campus. Thank you three. I just wanna say I did not put Sunshine or Swati up to saying nice things about me, but I am very appreciative of you um, for doing so. Um, a couple of things I'll just plug um, to build off of what our three students just shared. Um, Chris Hosfeld is, I can't, like words aren't enough to express how amazing he is in his work. And if you have access to Instagram or the HDS website, 
um, our annual Seasons of Light celebration, which took place this past Monday. It's a celebration and an honoring of holy light and holy darkness. Um, the recording of that just posted earlier today. So if you want to see some of Chris's magic at work, um, you can do so in that medium and get a, a taste of some of what happens here at HDS. Also on the Instagram page, you can see some great photos from that Diwali event that took place a couple weeks ago. Um, get a sense of the way that the students absolutely transformed the chapel on campus for this celebration, which was really beautiful to see. Um, and I just want to echo what you know the the three students have shared so far about one of the best things about HDS, nothing that I even as a staff member really love and appreciate is that we are such a small close-knit community. Um, it really does have this kind of small campus feel, but we are situated in a very large institution. So um, we can kind of have the best of both worlds in that we have that small community. And um, I forget, oh, Swati was saying like, when we came back from um, being online last year, I had to like remember to build in talking time when I was walking to meetings because I get stopped like three or four times to catch up with people. Um, that those conversations happen, people know your first name and say hi. Um, but you also have the benefit of the larger institution. So there are definitely gaps at HDS um, and things we may not have enough of, um, whether it's a subject matter expert. Um, or community, um, you know, sometimes you may be one of a very small community, um, whether that's a identity group or religious group, but you have the wider Harvard community where there are other folks that you can draw from and build networks with. Um, and there's a lot to happen outside of the HDS bubble as well. Um, so you kind of have, you know, two great options, the kind of large school feel, as well as that small intimate campus setting. All right, so enough from me. Um, the next question is, while there are lots of great things at HDS, there are also lots of things that we need to work on and do better. And we're constantly trying to grow um, and provide better and stronger support and resources. Um, so I'd ask our panelists to share what are some of the challenges you faced as an international student at HDS or in the US more broadly. Um, Let's switch it up and we'll go in reverse order. Um, Swati, Sunshine, and Martine, if you wanna take it away. I would like to begin by saying that there may be gaps and holes, as Katie said, but there is also a very supportive infrastructure and staff members that are committed and really help you bridge that gap. So given, like given COVID and all the health precautions that were taken in. So last year, our entire academic year took place via Zoom and virtual learning. So we were all in different parts of the world. I joined in from India and Sunshine was in the United States and there were people from different time zones. And that was particularly different for us as international students because we were looking for a community that has experiences similar to us but all of us were in different time zones and we had never met each other and that was a kind of fracture in our community that we felt and we just got back got together we would meet each other on zoom and there came an idea with me and sunshine that you know instead of our personal facetime meetings or these collaborated meetings and friendly hours. Let's just come up with an organization that caters to the interest of international students. And we started talking with Katie, who was very, very helpful. And I think it took us a time of about two weeks or so that we had our organization registered. And you could, like, there are also no barriers as to what something should be, uh, because the structure is so that it's catered to your needs and what you are supposed to do. As Martin said that, you know, there's this underlying emphasis that everything is for you. So you can come up with initiatives that you want and there is no fixed rule that it has to be that way. So our organization is more of like a social organization, which kind of helps people to connect to each other. 
and I would invite Sunshine to say more about that. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, as Swati said, we just kind of come up with this idea kind of last minute. And it's still like we still need to organize our stuff. But yeah, um, there is definitely the structure in place for you to both like join in and also for you to come up with your own ideas. Um, uh, and also we have a lot of different like cultural um, I guess organizations and like organization by traditions as well. Um, but not to speak too much about that, back to Katie's original question. Um, for challenges, I guess there are like a few things that Swati says are practical challenges, definitely as international students. As Swati says, she was in India last year um, because of COVID, um, traveling has been really hard. Um, getting visas has been really hard. I actually haven't been home for like two and a half years because I cannot uh, get visa issues. Um, and then, yeah, and then it just, these kind of stuff, you kind of always have to figure it out, like where there are help, but also like, it's unpredictable and you kind of just have to have that in mind uh, as an international student. Um, but yeah, and then on the other side, there are like also some like still challenges, although it's not that prevalent, like in terms of um, kind of putting in the international perspective in class. So there are definitely like courses that are very much designed from a very U.S. central perspective. And sometimes like I think most of the times the professors are very open if you are trying to tell them that this is um, not exactly the case or for your experience or you think that this is um, not like widely applicable enough or they're not really aware of like different traditions differences. Uh, I'm repeating myself, but yeah, you sometimes have to advocate uh, for yourself and you have to speak up. And that's not, I guess, not that hard. <laughs> you have to put a little bit of courage, but like most of the time people really appreciate um, whatever input you have. So um, yeah, that's um, thing. Um, and I guess last point, it's kind of for my experience. So like sometimes there are um, different kind of culture and environment between the different schools at Harvard. So like um, here at HDS, uh, it's a very close knit community, but you might find a little bit difference if you're taking classes in a different school. So you kind of have to have that expectation as well. But on the other hand, you also benefit a lot, like knowing that, I guess, um, what the, um, I don't know, like, first of all, different subjects and disciplines and different people, but also it's interesting to see the different like cultures at different schools um, and environment as well. So yeah, that's probably my experience. I'll leave it to Martin. Yeah, um, I agree with what you both said. And like for me, I studied, my undergrad was in Portugal. I don't think I mentioned that, but the transition has been a bit hard because, well, first of all, you're away from home, from family, all that is obviously hard. Um, but besides that, I feel like I had, I'm still in the process of getting attuned to the way we, we work academically here. So especially for things like section and seminars, I'd never done sections or seminars before. So it's like a closer, smaller group, discussing ideas academically, which is obviously obviously a thing you should do in academia, right? Because you're, you know, you're working and you're thinking and you're talking, you have to discuss these things. Uh, but for me, it was really, really hard to start approaching these issues as an active thinker slash academic, rather than just as a passive student. So like most of my classes back in Portugal were lectures. So I would go, I would, you know, I love learning, I love reading. So it would be like this very passive, absorbing like a sponge, all of this knowledge. And when I got here, I realized that the, the challenge here is to go a step further and start creating knowledge, being part of the process of creating knowledge. And that has been very challenging for me. Uh, even simple things like 
formulating questions for for section or for seminars you know you're supposed to prepare these what do you want to bring to the table uh and that has been extremely challenging for me also uh, expressing myself in english isn't as easy as in portuguese obviously um i did uh, my first years I, i lived in the us till i was six so i did you know speak english and i've read a lot of english but it has been hard to you know express myself adequately in this um in this setting and also uh it's a lot of work so it's a lot of readings uh uh it can be overwhelming you're always late um you know you're always running after what you're supposed to read you're trying to understand the texts uh it, sometimes they're very very hard texts so it takes a lot of time to get into them um and yeah i would say that those are are the three main things for me thank you all so much for sharing that um a couple of things i'll point out um so in addition to the support um uh, that osl provides we also have various supports available to students, particularly around academic reading and writing for folks who may not have had that prior experience as Martine was chatting about. So um, we have a few writing tutors um, on staff. We have graduate student learning support services, which our office um, student life oversees and can help you get connected to, and, and they can help with anything from uh, time management to organizing your work to um, you know, providing strategies for studying and reading if you are having difficulty in those areas um, or, you know, challenges acclimating. Um, there was something else I was going to say and it blew out. Oh, um, Martine mentioned sections. So we don't have a lot of large lectures, but there are a couple. Um, theories and Methods um, is the biggest one. All first year students take that course, Theories and Methods in the Study of Religion. Um, so in addition to the large lecture component, you have smaller section meetings where you meet with a more intimate group of students, usually led by a teaching fellow or a teaching assistant, maybe, you know, the term you're more familiar with, um, who will guide you through the different readings and have a deeper discussion of that week's course information. Um, in addition to um, our writing tutors, we have a specific um, teaching fellow in that course specifically for writing. Right now it's one of our um, PhD students, Mafaz Aswadian, who um, did her um, master's at HDS, her bachelor's at Emerson like me, and um, is now a PhD candidate here at Harvard in religion who provides specific writing support for theories and methods specifically because that can be one of the more overwhelming courses if you are coming from um, perhaps not a, a religious studies background in your undergrad. Um, it can be a little bit of a, you know, getting thrown into the deep end of the pool. So we provide extra supports there as well. Um, okay, so I have one more question and I'm just going to preview this now for our panelists, but Sunshine, you're going to be up first. Everybody gets a turn being first. Uh, we'll go Sunshine, Martine, and then Swati to close us out. Um, before I pose that question, I want to remind you, if you watching have questions, please enter them into the chat so I can relay them to our panelists when we finish up this last question I have on my list. Um, don't hesitate to, you know, ask that burning question that you may have there. Um, okay, so last question from me for the panelists. What, if anything, has surprised you about being an international student at HDS and or Harvard? Yes, uh, <laughs> thank you, Katie, for calling me out this time. Uh, <laughs> I guess I could probably step my surprise in the first question. I guess it just surprises me like how welcoming and um, close this community is because um, it's very different from kind of my um, experience in college. And I do not like kind of expect um, Swati the other day, she had a Diwali party and we had like um, people from all types of different background, cooking all types of different food, um, gathering all together. And just as Swati says, every week we meet for a community tea and everybody feel really like 
welcoming and really, I guess, very um, open to share their different experiences as well, because sometimes you feel like um, you kind of want to blend in as much as you just trying to be like everybody else. But I feel like my experiences here at um, HDS really make me be able to own up and appreciate my own experience and my own culture. And like, I am not religious and these are not things that you do not like speak about. These are things I guess you get really proud of. And um, speaking of, um, I guess, in addition to that, as Katie mentioned earlier, there was like this larger Harvard community thing that you can um, kind of access. So um, I guess for from my perspective, my personal experience um, being at HDS, it's like a very small and um, I guess very diverse community for me to exchange ideas. Um, with people from different backgrounds. And when I kind of like, there isn't a lot of Chinese students, for example, at HDS. So when I want to uh, have specific like kind of uh, interactions of my like kind of cultural celebrations and resources and that, uh, there's a huge um, Chinese student population in wider Harvard. So there are like different like student organizations and they have their own panels. I'm actually right now in one of the Chinese student acapella group. Um, so, you know, you get to interact with people um, as well. So that's also just, I guess, the best of both worlds um, from both HDS and Greater Harvard. I kind of like go out to have fun and then like cuddle in with my warm little community when I come back to HDS. So um, yeah, that's my <laughs> experience. I don't know who's up next. Um, yeah. I believe that's me. Um, what most surprised me, I think um, just the general feeling at home here. Um, it's just like I moved in, I'm living with two other people. You know, things could have been rougher, but everything's been so great. Like I've made so many friends. I've met so many fantastic people that I expect are going to continue to be my friends for the rest of my life. Um, the, the building is just beautiful. The, the HDS building, I mean, and like the classrooms are so well equipped. Like I really feel the, the library. It's just I feel like anything that I want to do is possible as long as I have an idea, you know, and that has been amazing, like feeling really welcome, feeling really part of this community. There's also no one from Portugal at HDS, but it, it, we somehow we transcend nationalities and religions and everything and just meet as, you know, normal people who are passionate about what we do. And that's just fantastic. think I'll again, once again echo what Martin just said because when I joined in there was no one from India and I was I was already very stressed and pressurized because I expected HDS and the larger Howard community to be very academically competitive and you have those people whose books you read and who you may watch on national television standing right in your classrooms and as Martin earlier said, it's academically very, very rigorous and you're always on the edge or running with the deadlines. But I would say when I started as a student and the academic year started, all my perceptions were like shattered very, very quickly because it is a very closely knit community. It literally feels like family, though there are people from different parts of the US and the world, people from different traditions and age groups. It almost, it never feels that you're talking to them for the first time. And there's that general feeling of being welcome. And there are other, I would say, one of my biggest, uh, like I did not expect that to be, but now I, this is one thing that I really, really appreciate, particularly in HDS, but at Howard at large, it's not just an institution for your academic training, which, and which offers you like a community or family support. There's much more than that. It appreciates you and treats you as a larger holistic person or as a 
like you know professional official or minister or whatever you want to be trained in and the way the infrastructure and academic curriculum and overall community in HDS works is that they're always looking at you as a student and a larger person what are you thinking how are you accommodating yourself your changes and you're always pushed to recognize the person in you and I'm at the end of my like third semester I'm quite surprised because I did not know myself like that and I that's something that I really really appreciate being part of here thank you all for sharing those reflections um that was I'm glad Swati you were at the end I think that was a beautiful note to end our little question and answer session on but Thank you, Martine, Sunshine, and Swati for all of your candor and um, your, your words today. Um, not to change gears too rapidly, but we do have a question um, from one of our attendees um, on application tips. So any application tips that come to mind specifically for international students? Um, any, I won't call on anybody if anybody has anything to share on application strategies, Martine? Yeah, I, I was a bit bold in my, in my, I'm hearing some feedback um, from my application. So my, um, what's it called? The motivation, motivational letter, because I was very honest. I didn't try to give off something that I was not. I said where I came from, what my childhood was like. Like I, I gave a very personal and, you know, a personal portrait of where I was coming from and why I, I wanted to go to HDS and what I wanted to do here and what I wanted to study here and why. And I didn't go off like in a very, you know, academic, professional, you know, kind of like very expertise oriented kind of thing. Um, no, I was just myself. And I tried to write why I was passionate about all this. And and it seemed to work. So um, maybe, I don't know, uh, if, if you're having doubts about what to write in that, just, you know, um, just be honest. Yeah. Thanks, my team. Um, uh, Alessandra can correct me if I'm stating something wrong, but admission, the admissions office has done a whole series of events such as the one we're in right now. Some of them focus specifically on app, uh, application strategies and um, writing the personal statement. And I don't see her, she's nodding, so I'm saying the right thing. And she can tell you, they were all recorded like this one, and she can tell you where to find them um, if you haven't checked them out yet. All right, so I can post a link or make sure that I post a link to our events calendar in the thank you email to those of you who are here and were able to make it to this session. But we do have an event calendar on our website that has recordings for sessions that we've done specifically breaking down the application. So we have three videos under that one. Um, and certainly other we have also uh, videos on the specific de degree program. So focusing in on the MTS, hearing from students in that degree, as well as faculty members, the MRPL and the MDiv as well. So. All right. Um, I think we are, we're ready to end this session. I don't see any other uh, questions in the Q&A. Uh, so I'll go ahead and thank you all for, for your time. Thank you, Katie. Thank you to our students for your vulnerable responses and, and for sharing a little bit more about, you know, the, the scary parts about, you know, considering Harvard and, and its reputation and what it would be like for you to, to, to fit here and, and just the wonderful vibrancy that, that you contribute. It's, it's you that makes our institution so special. It's your openness. It's your curiosity. It's your warmth and friendliness. And um, as a new staff member myself, having had the privilege of walking around campus and getting to meet you all, it's been a real joy. So, so thank you and thank you, Katie, for your, your expert um, knowledge and, and moderating our panel. You are a wealth of knowledge and I know that a lot of our students um, are grateful to you for the work that you do for them. Uh, so, so thank you all. 
there will be a recording of this session available. And again, I'll have all those links for you to access additional um, opportunities coming up this month. So thank you for your time. I hope that you managed to get some rest if you're tuning in from really far. Uh, and thank you for your time. Bye, everybody. <laughs>